Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. Today starts a two-part arc centered around DevOps. Today, I bring on my friend, Neil Gompa, to unpack the development side of the methodology. Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. I'm Brandon, and this week I wanted to revisit DevOps. The last episode on the subject, Eric and I had a back and forth on our point of view on DevOps, and I wanted to revisit the subject. I didn't want to be predictable and bring on the usual thought leaders in this space or an industry analyst. I wanted to bring on someone that actually lives DevOps day to day. To unpack this, I'm joined again by Neil Gampa. Neil joined us on our first episode around careers, which was focused around becoming a DevOps engineer. Neil is known in the Destination Linux community as an open source advocate, a Fedora, CentOS stream, and OpenSUSE contributor, and that's just his hobby. Neil is also a senior DevOps engineer at Datto. Datto is a leader in providing MSP solutions, including network and backup solutions. <laughs> This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. Predictable pricing, robust product docs, and services that developers love. Get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful comp cloud computing. Get growing at DigitalOcean. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash tux2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by third party security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash DLN and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show and the entire Destination Linux network. Thanks for joining me again on the pseudo show. I appreciate you coming back on. Yeah. Hey, Brandon. I'm always ecstatic to come and hang out with you. A lot of people probably would ima could imagine this, but... Before the show, Neil and I ended up talking for almost an hour <laughs> before recording this. Uh, it's and uh, I always have a good time talking to you, Neil. So. Oh man, it's a ton of fun, and yeah, we it we always have great conversations, and I feel so energized when we when we get a chance to chat. So it's I guess really not that surprising we wound up spending an hour talking about stuff before we got ready for this. Yeah. But I'm pumped, so let's do this. Yeah. So today's topic focused on DevOps, at, but I want to kind of focus in on developers. But we'll, but knowing Neil and I will probably skid off into into operations as well. For now, I kind of want to start off with formal definition, and let's just have a conversation around this. Definition of DevOps is fighting the two walls between or or the wall between dev the development teams and operations teams that's essentially the definition from devops.com devops is also meant to be about people people over process and tools basically put people first let them do you know essentially uh, help them work better with each other it is really the crux of it and for me, it's not just, it's a, it's a culture shift, not necessarily a process change. Like some of the processes may change, 
I have an unpopular opinion. I was talking to Neil about this too, but is that you can still be a waterfall shop and and heavy ITIL processes and still adopt a DevOps culture, right? It's not about what project management process you're using. So Neil, let's let's start unpacking that. In a traditional sense, I know DevOps, it, you know, might it sounds very foreign, but we bit you know we in the last episode we talked about you moving into dev uh, into a DevOps style role. So like what what's your perspective on this? I mean, we we touched on it a bit last episode. So I think you you've kind of got it right here where um it, it it's less about your project management style and more about the people that are working with it. Like, as I said previously, like I started in QA and just kind of got accidentally purposefully sort of shunted into this space. I actually agree with you on your opinion that, uh, that when you look at DevOps and, and processes, you don't need to do something like scrum or agile or whatever to have DevOps because DevOps is not about process or tools fundamentally. It's about having people that bridge the, the gap between development and, and operations and bringing operational expertise to developers and development expertise to operations. And people who are capable of bridging that divide uh, make it so that those teams can work together and help each other be more successful. I tend to look at DevOps as... Um, people like myself coming in, working with software engineering teams, working with infrastructure engineering teams, and bringing my capabilities, my knowledge, my expertise to help them be successful. And when they're successful, I'm successful too. And our success supports each other in either delivering a service or a product or a technology or some other enabling condition for something else to happen. So that's kind of how I look at it. and. I've worked at a place where, you know, I've worked at, in, in a waterfall-like environment. And in a waterfall-like environment, the the main difference between what a lot of people associate with Agile, like Scrum, for example, versus a waterfall, is that the requirements gathering involves a lot of communication up front. Then you do a bunch of building, and then you make something that is a deliverable that is defined in the requirements gathering phase, you present it to the customer, the stakeholder or whatever. They turn around and tell you what you did well and what you did wrong, and you go back and rinse and repeat. Technically speaking, Agile is just about shortening those iteration cycles. Instead of saying you got to get it all done, you know, up to a spec first before presenting it, it's get it mostly formed so you can show what you're doing, have the customer give you feedback early so that you can iterate on it and, and adjust and pivot and that sort of thing. Like, a lot of companies do scrum processes in such a way where there is no external stakeholder involved. And that's a mistake. And that leads you down long iter long development cycles that you don't think of as long development cycles because you do things like sprints and you think, oh, a sprint is a, is, a, is a development cycle. No, a development cycle is a cycle in which everything happens. You bring it to a stakeholder. The stakeholder tell gives you feedback and you go back again. And so that's my opinion when it comes to these sorts of things. And I think that DevOps itself is an aspect that embodies building on that philosophy. And that does not necessarily require you to go from what people call a waterfall process or an ITIL-like process or whatever, an ITIL-mandated process, to a um, scrummish process or whatever process people want to label as agile. Agility comes from p different stakeholders working together to solve the problem together more quickly. Doesn't matter how you do it. I've said this with uh, one of my friends, you know, you, the whole purpose of dev and ops of devops is to have devops expertise. Uh, I mean operations expertise. And then developer expertise, like I call operations excellence and developer excellence, or in, or software engineering uh, excellence, working together. One of the things I hate about DevOps is how it's being coupled and with agile. Like you can't say DevOps without people immediately going, "Oh, I got to implement um, daily standups," you know, have a and, and get a Scrum master. But that's not. 
And all what DevOps is, it's that culture shift. If I could wave a magic wand, it would be to dispel the myth that you need to be an agile shop to do DevOps. You don't. That's that's my opinion. Um, I know, um, again, as I said earlier, unpopular opinion. It's popular with me. <laughs> when, when I think of DevOps, so yeah, again, like you, you spelled it out really well. Let the, just let people talk to each other, work with people better. And also, like, yeah, maybe do adopt something from Agile, shorten the iteration cycles and keeping the business stakeholders involved. One of the problems that I, I, I think you did bring this up was developers just go do, you know, go do a bunch of sprints, uh, five sprint, five, two week sprints later, they come back and go here, this is what we got. And the business stakeholders all go look at each other and go, this isn't what we wanted. <laughs> yep. I've seen that. I've seen that face before from, from business stakeholders before. And it's like, Oh no, somebody decided to multi sprint this. <laughs> because uh, the, the the problem with a lot of ways people think of scrum processes is that they think of it in terms of how do you figure out how to iterate on development to close a feature, right? To, to release a feature or release a capability or develop a product or whatever. But in a lot of places, I have seen it where it is, at no point does anyone think about the business stakeholders, the customers, or even the other engineering stakeholders. One of the biggest mistakes that I often see in, in, in development processes, like, you know, we're talking about the dev and DevOps here. One of the biggest mistakes I often see is that the DevOps mentality of working with stakeholders just doesn't occur to developers. And so it really takes someone thinking about that to make sure that that happens because if nobody brings it up and nobody makes sure that 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 conversation happens on a regular basis as part of development processes it's really easy for things to go off off the deep end and and not be the right thing you wanted and i think that's a lot of the value that devops brings to the table is because being a bridge to these to these other groups can you know bring that operational um knowledge to the development process i i always felt that like devsecops was a silly term to come up oh with. come on you too uh, you you I, you mentioned thought, this the this term the devsecops well i thought it was silly to come up with it but like w one of the things that i i never understood why, why do we come up with uh with this term, wasn't it implied that if operations and dev is working together, but like, I think that's one of the things that it actually, it, it did solve. Uh, I, I think uh, it's sometimes I think that uh, enterprise security teams just want to make sure that they're, you know, they, they get a spot in the, in the new world too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, my opinion about the, the whole day. So the, my opinion about the DevSecOps term is probably colored by the fact the first time I ever heard of it was from a um, a configuration management vendor trying to rebrand themselves as a DevSecOps tool. I won't name names because it's pretty embarrassing for the vendor in question, but um, they ha I asked them what DevSecOps was because it was the first time I'd ever heard of it, and they couldn't tell me what it was. They just said that their tool was a DevSecOps tool, and that was that just kind of broke my brain a little bit. Uh, and so I have a little bit of a prejudice against the term because I, I, I it seems to be that. a bit, it seems to be a vendor term more than an industry term. I understand that. Like what, like one of the thing, like pretty much my point is, is like, I, I feel like it's made software enterprise software in particular. I mean, this is, this is where it's used. It has made enterprise software better. Oh, you're able sure. to, and more secure in many ways because you're, ha because the operations is heavily involved, they they think about what what actually kind of going back to the DevOps definition, what what why it matters. So operations has goals and devs have goals. Without you know, if you're 
thinking of legacy. The devs want to get things done quickly and get features out the door. Ops wants stability and security. And those are can be conflicting. But mm-hmm. when you but when you have everyone moving in the same direction, this is why I think DevOps is uh, done, done so well for the industry, especially from a security perspective. I know some people may disagree with that, but it. I think it. I think it kind of depends on the culture that a, that a, that implements. Um, you know these DevOps types roles. Like I'm, I'm, I'm saying DevOps type roles because they go by many, many names. Like. Even when I started uh, uh, in doing this whole DevOps thing, my title wasn't DevOps engineer. Like, yes, today I'm senior DevOps engineer, and that that's great and all. But like, most of the time in my career, I wasn't called a DevOps engineer, and I was doing DevOps practice and DevOps work the whole time. Like, I remember one of my colleagues said, "You know, we should have a DevOps team because there's, you know, Neil here, you know, is is just." naturally do straddling the line between development and operations and doing stuff to help support us. And that was, you know, that was great. Uh, talking about myself in the third person is less great, but like the, but that, that cultural concept uh, and, and that attitude adjustment that comes with it doesn't imply that you have specific titles or specific type of people, but what it does is imply that you have a culture of continuous, not delivery because that's a whole different thing, but continuous improvement and continuous um, critical thinking of of your of your people, your tools, your processes, and and a continual uh, effort to better yourself, uh, and that can be from a personal development, a professional development, from a team development, from a product development, from a corporate development, like. I am not excluding technic. I'm not excluding the business people because business people are part of this too. Um, I, I feel like when we talk about development, um, especially with DevOps, it's really easy for us to forget the business objectives, the business goals, and the business value we're trying to bring to the table. And and that's I think because we do a disservice with DevOps in general in that we don't have. I'm going to coin a dumb term now. We don't have biz DevOps. Ah, you oh, I was going to say dev biz ops. I'm like you're going to I'm going to make your head explode, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm serious. Like so there is a thing called biz dev, which is business development. And that and that whole process is actually around it's not necessarily applying software development principles to business cuz that doesn't make any sense. But it is, what it is about is um looking at how do you evolve your business um, to support the business's future. Um, And in the same way, software development is about how do you evolve the software to support the future of the software? I I truly do think that a biz DevOps type role should exist because if you factor in business, uh, if you have business representatives involved in infrastructure and software teams and you have them all collaborating, there's potential for some true real agility in the sense that if if there's a team that believes in a solution or a, or a technology or a pattern or a platform or something that they feel can actually accomplish their goals really well, then having a business partner in their team can help them succeed in accomplishing that goal. Well, a lot of uh, software that's developed today has business logic baked in. So it's important to have these people helping, especially with like when you have great tools. I'm going to name off some open source tools for handling that this the biz dev stuff, the biz DevOps. We're going <laughs> to start using that now. So the you have tools that are meant meant for this so drools is one of them opta planners another so you build software around business logic so opta planner you know it's based on drools is just an easy way for you to 
uh, where do I need a uh, best place resources? Like whether that's people resources or system resources, like best place based on the most affordable cloud with OptiPlanner. You can do that with OptiPlanner. Or one of my favorite use cases that's on the OptiPlanner website is uh, what's the best route for a truck to take, like specifically for like repair and uh, like a rep- like a fleet of repair technicians. So which one, which route should they go on so that they have a nine to five day and, and have the least traffic and also make sure they have tool, the right tools in their truck. Also make sure they have, um, or the correct skills for every job on that, uh, on that route. So that, that, and that's not a developer's job. That's a business analyst business you know, with the biz dev side, as you as you described it. That's their role in supporting these applications that get developed. Right, and I would argue that is a type of a DevOps role. It may not seem like one at first glance because, oh, DevOps is about infrastructure and and software development, right? But no. It also matters that you have the business support in there too. And like those analysts or biz dev people or biz rel, whatever you want to call them. Like I've heard many different terms for this over the years. What it boils down to is that this is a, this is a person who operates as the representative for the software development team in the business, but also functions as the business advocate for that team and understands the business relationship and can help the engineering teams, infrastructure and software, navigate those waters and allow them to be successful. Like, so if they want to do something that's from a business perspective, particularly um, different or unique, ordinarily an engineering team, like I don't want to paint a wide brush, but ordinarily an engineering team is not necessarily equipped to navigate the political waters, to pull off something like that. You may have a few special folks who are politically savvy, but generally speaking, that's not a thing. Having someone who is able to be an advocate for your, um, for your team in the business and then work within the business for you to support your needs is exactly a DevOps type capability. It's just something that happens on the business side. I think it's just something people ignore because it's a it's a hard problem. And it's something that, unlike a lot of the ways people talk about DevOps, it can't be cookie cutter. It must be unique to your business because your business is unique. Yeah. And I, I think the reason why people don't focus on it is it's kind of boring. But it's important. It's very important. Most of the most of the important things are boring. I don't care. It's important. <laughs> you should no, you should absolutely. do something about it. <laughs> Exactly. That, that is my point, but I do, uh, that, that's why it's, I just, the, the, uh, people that people aren't, people like shiny things they, they, <laughs> and, and, and they like it and they, and they like excitement, Neil, the, like the, that boring stuff is boring. And, uh, <laughs> I like exciting stuff too, but I also want my boring stuff to also be, you know, Stay boring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it needs to be that. That's the stuff that needs to remain uninteresting, right? Because if if that's exciting, there's a problem, right? Yeah. What what right at the bat, right at the bat, like part of that the DevOps definition, it says that it's not about tools, and. <laughs> oh boy, we're going to talk yeah. about tools now, aren't we? <laughs> we're we're going to talk a bit about tools. But here's the problem. There, there are tools all over the place that say, oh, I quote unquote enable DevOps, which makes no sense to me, but whatever. Uh, like if it's like, yeah, here's a platform that uh, allows you to quickly deploy your apps to and you easily integrating all your development tools into it. Like that's like an OKD. Like, yeah, OK, I get it. Right, that uh, sort of, mostly, I get it, especially with the lower lowering that barrier to entry into in, into into uh, getting developers onboarded, fully integrated platform. 
like CI tools. Like CI tools have been around forever, well before DevOps, but apparently they're, it's a DevOps tool. It, it, that just breaks my brain. Like how, like CI tools, oh, and, and let's not forget, now we have this new scare quotes, scare quotes, since the world can't see it, I am holding scare quotes, of CD tools now, which are just CI tools that are just not able to do builds that just ship code right it, it they're not new like they're they're things we've had forever but now they're getting rebranded because we need shiny labels for everything which okay fine I, i've been using jenkins since it was called hudson yes i had to stop you from calling it hudson earlier <laughs> <laughs> so i i occasionally accidentally call jenkins hudson but it's still almost the same uh, mascot but I mean, it still says Hudson inside of some of its code. So like, I can't argue with you there, but it's still Jenkins today. Although their, their Jenkins has gotten real different lately. Yeah. Um, it, it's definitely much different. Like it's definitely gotten a lot better. It still scares the crap out of me. Oh, it definitely scares me. But like one of the things that it was great for automating testing, like when I was working with it, the team I was on, we didn't have QA engineers. And so we built a lot of testing into Jenkins and also some other tools. Anyone who's been in Ruby long enough, the probably familiar with Capistrano. Yeah. I that. wish I wasn't familiar with Capistrano. <laughs> well, we used it for, it's now called continuous delivery. Mm -hmm. Little, a little side tangent here, just a real quick note. Um, one of the companies that Datto acquired years ago was a little company, a little startup called Backupify. This little company, Backupify, was a Ruby shop, and they, they chose to do everything in Ruby. Their configuration management was Chef, which is Ruby. Their, uh, their code bases were written in Ruby. Their CI was a custom apparatus. Their CI CD was a custom apparatus they wrote themselves in Ruby. That custom apparatus was built on Capistrano. They called it Rubber. Um, uh, my understanding is that today, Rubber is still maintained by the guy who created it at Backupify, and now he works at Oracle. Um, but it is, yeah, it's Rubber, and I'll, I'll shoot it. It's kind of limited, and I don't think we really use it anymore. But like, yeah, like so. The re my experience with Capistrano is I'm a little traumatized from from. Oh, I don't oh. blame you <laughs> from it. I mean, I wrote a lot of really cool things that at the time I thought was great because I was deploying code right into production. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, I was the ops guy, but I was writing all the tooling to do you know, all the testing, all the delivery and make it seamless. And that's really the developer part of DevOps, right? Like when, when you think about, when people think about DevOps, they think oftentimes that they're either glorified sysadmins or extra developers or whatever. And there's some truth to both of those, but the reality is the, the, the what a de DevOps person is, is a person that can help support the, the, the developers in their, in their, um, development and business goals. And that includes being a developer when needed. Like I cannot tell you how many times as a DevOps engineer, I've had to get down and dirty into code bases. I have no bloody clue what I'm doing in and actually have to spend time writing complex code in code bases. I have no idea about to get things done so that products could be released that way. And, you know, after that, I would off board or onboard someone into that project give them the what for about like what's going on and and make sure that they're successful keeping up with it. Like sometimes it's being the emergency parachute to help make sure that something can go right. Uh, and sometimes it's the advocate to help support the team in doing what they need to, to accomplish their goals. And sometimes it's a little mix of everything. So sometimes when I, when I hear what you've specifically described is you know, when DevOps is a role, you're the bridge between the big, the, the developers and the people actually keeping the servers up and running. In this example, 
I was the ops guy on that other side of that bridge. And I was working with the devs, but we, I, I'd have to cross that bridge to help them with stuff. They'd have to cross that bridge to help you. So that's I, in a, this that's case, a, that's was, a good way to work. Yeah, and I and the, I actually it was great for me. There are two ways to handle DevOps: either the role where you're act where there's someone acting as that bridge, or or there is no uh, person to act as that bridge. You just tore down the wall between the dev and ops, and now the teams are starting to integrate, and they're now cross-functional teams instead of two separate teams. And, you know, both have their advantages and disadvantages. They enable, it helps enable a lot of uh, uh, good conversations. Uh, it helps uh, in the case of like dev, like when, you know, on the dev side, like writing good tests so that uh, for their software, so that when they hand their code to the ops, to the, to the operations people that actually have to deal with it day to day, deal with their messy code and 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 they know it works that's the that for me that's the crux of this is like yeah. knowing for sure that like whether if it's gone through jenkins whether if it's gone uh and it's some automated tests in there or uh actually i'm gonna pick a less common project that i that i don't think gets a lot of praise is open qa oh my goodness i i have i have so much love in my heart for open qa yeah, you know, having a package pop out of that, out of that, and being able to be rest assured that it's been tested and done, and I and all the their green lights, and I get to mm. then deploy it in production without a lot of headaches, yeah. and and then I don't have to own the pieces like that. That code base goes that if, that, if there's a problem with the code, it roll back. And then it goes back on the developer to go fix their code. Right. Yeah. Um, at Datto, uh, so to speak more concretely in a practical sense, at Datto, we have a hybrid model between the um, people like me and the people like you kind of thing. So we have what we like to say is embedded um, DevOps and SRE type folks in the individual software teams. We also have a coordinating central team, which is where I'm in. And the two types work together to make sure that everyone is able to function reasonably well. And the reason we do it this way is because um, after you get to a certain scale, the individual crossing doesn't work too well. And you need some kind of coordinator and some kind of person to, some kind of group to keep everyone on, on the same page. But at the same time, um, the business itself, like the business people can't handle going to all the different people individually. And so they need a mediator to help um, translate business objectives into something that um, teams can turn around and implement um, in a reasonably responsive fashion. Uh, and so we have this hybrid model where we've got both of these types in place where we have embedded SREs and embedded DevOps people who then turn around and talk to, you know, um, my, uh, the team I'm part of, as well as the, um, the infrastructure engineers and the rest of the uh, of our cloud teams and platform teams, uh, and and I think that makes it. Uh, I think that's actually a good balance because it it sets you up for success as you scale. It also me it builds in a culture of making sure you have operational knowledge within your development teams um, as you build out new products and services. Because if you turn it into a prerequisite that you have a security champion, as we like to call it, a operations champion or a bit and a business champion uh, and, and, and a tooling champion and a platform champion, like having all these different people, you know, as part of your software development teams from the beginning, you're going to build better products and solutions. And I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. It definitely helps make things better. I, don't have to parachute in as much as I would have had to in the past because like I am passing on this expertise to those people and they're able to turn around, use the stuff that I parachuted into to help support themselves so that I don't need to parachute in later. And, and we can build on that camaraderie, that the strong relationship to, you know, work together to build better stuff. And, you know, 
you were you're mentioning tools and things like that. One aspect of this where you know this this split tends to work out super well is that the embedded teams, the embedded champions, can work with the um, with the central team, as as I like to think of it, um, to kind of do requirements gathering, process enumeration, and tools consolidation. So, for example, at Datto. We use a tool that I don't think a lot of people think about in terms of um, a DevOps type tool, um, although I, I really don't like calling tools DevOps type tools, but sure, whatever. We have an open build service instance internally, and and we've been very public about this. I've given talks at the OpenSUSE conference about it before, and even at Nest with Fedora, where we've made mentions of it, and as well as at CentOS Dojos and so on. Like I've, I've talked about it at, at length, and anyone who wants to hear about it, I'm happy to blather on about it more. But we run an open build service instance um, internally to service the entire company. We have um, internal tools and workflows that we use with our open build service instance to integrate it with our, our Git server, which is a GitLab system. And we use GitLab CI with open build service to um, make this all work together. You know, my personal objective is that I want to bring these tools that I've made out of the open so other people can benefit from it. And also so that open source projects can benefit from other people can learn from it because um, a big part of my belief around DevOps is incrementally building the knowledge and the, and the cache of tools to help make people successful. And, and so like from the dev perspective of DevOps, I make tools to make workflows work. And I make tools to make good workflows work and make bad workflows suck. Like putting it very bluntly, that is the way that, you know, I tend to view it. Uh, th this goes, you know, probably to a subject, uh, whether if we'll have another episode about it, we'll, we'll see, is ops. Because like the whole idea behind the ops side of DevOps is to get the infrastructure out of the way. Mm -hmm. So developers can just go code and do whatever they need to do. The QA engineers build proper QA practices. And, and the, by the way, I, it's also give and take. They've right. built, the developers have built proper tests and their packages, excuse me, their code can get packaged up into a nice, neat package, whether that's a container, an RPM package. Right. And seeing that, like, like I was saying, like just seeing those check marks makes everything better for everyone and and the tools that enable these enable this culture shift i think are really important to yeah. to to enable the culture shift even though like every definition i've read it's not about the tools i'm like well the tools are important because they do enable it right so the way i tend to look at it is um you 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 make tools to implement culture, to implement um, processes, to, imp to implement your vision. For example, one reason why uh, I we have an open build service internally at Datto is because open build service allows us a, a unique property among package and container build systems that most things don't have. And that is developers can make their own stuff without me having to be involved. So one thing that we we offer as part of our open build service instance internally is that if you want to build a package or an image or whatever, just for you to play around with, to you to just get your hands wet, your hands dirty, or get your fingers wet with it, um, you can you can look at our open build service instance. You can log in. It'll create you a project namespace of your own, a personal namespace that you can do whatever you want. And because it is a fully functioning build service, it can publish that content for you to consume yourself. Now, anything you do yourself is not going to go out to production. There is a gate and there's a limiter. Anything that's going to go out to customers, to production infrastructure, routes through, uh, through the team I'm part of to make sure that those checks are in place, that things are set up right, that we ferry things over, like that part is done there, but like everything else up to that point, if the, de the the developer gets to write the spec file, they get to see how the spec file gets builds the the RPM or the deb. We use RPM spec files to build both RPMs and debs. 
uh, and they can download the artifacts that they built, run it on systems, and see how it goes. It iterates super quickly. We provide the tools for them to learn and grow and do this themselves. And if they need help, they can reach out to me or anyone else um, on the team to, to, to get assistance. But they are able to do it themselves, which allows their embedded resources, their embedded security champions, their embedded um, operations champions, their embedded business champions, and all these other people to come together to help them implement these practices, to be able to do the right thing, to be able to ship software in a way that they know that they're confident will work. And, and I think that's actually really important to... One thing that I think a lot of companies tend to miss, and I have been to a lot of trade shows and I've gone to a lot of trade events and webinars and whatever, is something that I, I think people have missed is that people need room to experiment, to grow and learn. And one thing that um, culturally I have personally tried to imbue in all of our tools and all of our processes is to give people the freedom to experiment without feeling like they're going to be slapped for it. Because if they don't get a chance to learn, experiment, and make mistakes, they don't get a chance to grow. Yep. Self-service, be able to just build any system, any service, quickly destroy it, be done with it. Like that. that is goes to what I think is the core tenant of the op side is to be able to enable that. So the interesting thing is I actually don't think of it as an op side thing. I think of it as a dev side thing. The reason I think of it as a dev side thing is because for me, the operational aspect comes around maintenance about actually delivering it. And everything before that point is from my perspective, developer centric. So if I'm producing a build service instance that lets people build packages that they can install and run, I still consider that developer centric rather than operational cent- operational because oh, the package side for sure, but also the yeah. installation, the ability to spin up infrastructure for them to play with. I consider that all dev side until it's going to go through a production path because I want as many aspects of the software development life cycle. You can't see it because this is audio, but I'm waving my hands in a full circle for no reason at all. But the whole that whole process, I want as many steps of that to happen way before we hit an operational checkpoint. When we hit an operational checkpoint, that's when things go have to have a whole new set of stakeholders and have a whole new set of things that have to go in. I want to have people have the opportunity to learn as developers, what it's like for their software to run. And so giving them the capability to do that and providing tooling around it, like OpenShift, as you mentioned earlier, or OKD, right? That's a Kubernetes platform that enables people to, that has all the tooling built in to enable people to do this kind of thing with containerized things. Um, If you were looking at like, a personal favorite of mine for virtualized based workloads is Overt. Um, Overt is great for this kind of stuff because it's very easy to deploy virtual machines. It has a good automation surface and it is very simple for people to work with. And because it's built on KVM, it's very similar to what kind of production environment um, um, virtualization characteristics you're going to have. Um, or you could do it with OpenStack if you can get it all working. Um, then if you look at uh, with open build service, you can build um, packages and images and containers and all those things. Um, open QA gives you the ability to have it run through test cycles. And again, I consider all these things dev side because I want as many of these things to be happening within the scope of the development team because they're the most equipped to solve those problems. So the way I tend to look at it is that these te- these things should be useful and available and accessible to developers in, in, in the fullest way possible. I'm, I've always been thinking that like the ops team will need to run it. 
mm. or even uh, write a lot of the automation around enabling self-service. And that's because that's a lot of the ways, like a lot of the enterprises I work with, that's the way they handle it is the ops team is building the entire or ops adjacent mm -hmm. is building the uh, the self-service capabilities for the developers. But you're, it, it, from what I'm hearing, it's uh, you, from your point of view, it should be squarely in the dev half of this. So it may be that operational people are the ones implementing a lot of this stuff, but we should always keep in mind that this is not about production. This is not about operations for, for scale or for maintenance or any of those things. None of this is for that. This is for making development side stuff better. And so we're developing tools. We're developing workflows. We're developing patterns. We're developing processes. We're developing habits. We're, we're developing a culture. And we're doing it, and ideally, we're doing this with their input. And so I consider it dev side, because if the devs aren't bought onto it, it doesn't matter. None of it matters if the developers don't like it. You have to sell them on it. it they, they, you have to sell them on it. You have to make them believe in it. You have to have them want them to do it. And the best way I've ever seen that to work out is to have them be part of it. Yeah, a lot of dev, a lot of projects fail if the dev team isn't involved. I've right. seen that everywhere. Like the dev, if the like if the developers don't like the tooling, it's out. It's gone. Absolutely, because if they're not going to use it, it's a waste. So that's that's like I think you could make a good case for it to be either one. I just think from my perspective, I. The reason I've been talking about it in here is because we're talking about dev. And from my perspective, I consider this a very dev-centric aspect of it. There are definitely ops-centric aspects to this. And when we talk about ops more, I'm happy to like bring in the ops part of this equation. But I do think of them as dev tools too. And so uh, like version control, like Git, you know, most people would think of it as a dev tool. But I'm actually... It's a DevOps tool. <laughs> I, let me get to my point, Fred. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of people would say that it's a dev tool, right? Because it's a developer who uses it, right? They're the ones interfacing it. But I can make the argument that it's an operations tool too, because it allows you to understand the change history of, of something. It allows you to understand the evolution of something. And as it rolls out, if something goes wrong, if your developers are appropriately um, um, disciplined, you can pinpoint change sets and understand where you know undesirable effects may have been introduced, and you can work as an operations guy with the devs dev person to fix it. And so it, I can make an argument for Git, which almost everyone I've ever talked to says is a dev tool. I can make an argument for it to be an ops tool because it is incredibly useful as an operational tool. Um, and, and, and so that's the kind of thing. It's like all about perspective. You need, you need a spot to put your uh, Ansible playbooks. Right. Or if it's just silly putty shell scripts, which a lot of places are doing it just that way. And that's not necessarily bad. As long as the silly putty shell scripts are well understood, documented, and people can work with it, that's fine. I think that if your silly putty shell scripts are more than 200 lines of code, we're going to have some words. If that's the way you want to roll, I mean, if it's version control tracked and everyone gets it and it works, go for it. I was trying to turn the conversation into tools but as you can see like it quickly divulges into people it because it doesn't matter what the tool is frankly but it does i do think it is important that a tool should help enable the culture shift it doesn't need to be the coolest tool on the planet that everyone uses whether if that's kubernetes whether if that's git 
you could still use subversion and still be a DevOps shop, but I wouldn't recommend it. I saw somebody using it with CVS. I wouldn't recommend that either, but it's a thing. Oh, yeah. We had words about that at some point. It's like, uh, yeah, we know, but it works. It's like, all right, but man, <laughs> you do you. And again, like on 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 the CI front, doesn't matter what you use. You can use tools that no that no one's heard of, except in the open source space, like OpenQA or something that everyone's heard of, like Jenkins and Tecton. And now Argo, we're going to go for continuous delivery, a specific tool for CD. <laughs> Good Lord. You can't see it, but I'm face palming right now because he just said this. <laughs> but that's what it's for. It's for CD, Neil. That says so right on the website. For I Argo. know. It calls itself Argo CD and everything. <laughs> well, joking aside, it seems like a nice tool. It's it is, and it's integrated with OKD. So, little sales pitch. Just as long as the tool enables the culture, that's really the summary that Eric and I had when we talked about this. However many episodes ago it was when when uh, I think I think it was even in our first year uh, where we talked about DevOps, and uh, th- and it's still the case. I mean, th- th- with this conversation, it's about a culture shift. It's not about it's not about the process. It's like, I, I, like again, they mention everyone mentions separating DevOps from the process. I mean, DevOps you know, separating the people from the process, and they immediately say, "Well, to be DevOps, you got to use this process." And I, I think you and I dispelled that myth a little bit. I think we could dive into that even more. Oh, but... for sure. Like <laughs> the the amount of the. I think to put it very succinctly, there's no such thing as decoupling people from process and tools because it's all about culture. Culture is built on people, tools, and process. All of those things have to work together to actually accomplish a goal or objective. And if you want a DevOps type environment, like whatever you conceive DevOps to be, hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea of what a DevOps environment can be like then you have to think about all of it together because it's not loosely coupled. You can't really separate them. They're all part of it together because if you have a desire to do um, to do this kind of thing where you want to break down walls and you want people to work together, but your tools straight up don't let you because they're archaic or have um, rigidity in them that prevents you from doing things like you know, giving access rights for a subset of permissions so that a developer can also assist in operational workloads um, or things like that, then you fail because you can't you can't get those people to be part of the of that that culture shift because your tools are blocking you. But at the same time, tools are not necessarily totally central to this. And in fact, I, I would argue that they're not because they're they're intentionally fungible. Like, so if you, if a vendor tells you we are the DevOps platform, businesses implement DevOps by using us, I will tell you flat out, you don't need it. You can do DevOps without it. Maybe you want to use that tool. Maybe it's a, it, it implements your vision of how you want things to work and that's fine, but it is not required to do DevOps well. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss. If you'd like more of the pseudo show, you can find it over at pseudo.show and on social media at pseudo show podcast and on YouTube. Please go subscribe to the YouTube channel. That will be down. The link will be down in the show notes. You can catch more awesome content at our network partners, destinationlinux.network. You can support the show on Patreon at pseudo.show slash Patreon or sponsors at pseudo at pseudo.show slash sponsors. There'll be links in the show notes. Neil, anywhere you'd like to send our listeners? Uh, well, same place as last time. You want to catch me on Twitter? I'm at twitter.com slash uh, det underscore Conan underscore Kudo. Or if you're a native Twitterati, it is at Detective Conan Kudo. Uh, I'm on Mastodon um, at Conan Kudo. 
um, at fostodon.org. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to hang out with me on, uh, I'm around in Fedora and OpenSUSE and all those in their, on, in their matrix rooms, uh, at, uh, and I'm on matrix as a Conan underscore kudo colon matrix.org. That is the address. It's a little hard to remember that because it's flipped from email addresses and that always throws me a little bit for a loop. But yeah, if you want to reach out to me, I'm also, you know, best way to reach me is on Twitter. Um, but if you'd like to also reach me on Mastodon, I check out there too. Um, or, you know, just drop random emails to Brandon and we'll see whether, you know, they make their way over to me somehow. <laughs> you know, to send feedback to... Um, to send feedback to no reply at, <laughs> at pseudoshow.com. That that show at pseudo that show. <laughs> Here I was gonna say. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Contact was, at pseudo dot show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to hear more of Brandon and I talking after this little um, little DevOps series is wrapped up, there's a lot that we could we could discuss, and I would love to to be on more to do more things. And you will be. Thanks, Neil. You can follow me on most social media at. D. Brandon Johnson or my website at open tech.net and new content at destination links.network. Thank you for listening to the pseudo show where business meets open source. Until next time.